Hello, Facebook and uh, YouTube. I'm David Common here in uh, St. George, Ontario, with Mark Winton, who is uh, an expert mechanic, a licensed mechanic, both for cars and for trucks. And we're here to take any and all questions you might have. This is coming out of a story that we did at CBC Marketplace. I'm a journalist looking at you know, what dealership repair centers tell you you need to do in terms of the amount of work, um, whether they might be telling you stuff that you don't necessarily need done to your car or don't need it done at the time. Mark is here to answer all sorts of questions. Mark, you do all, all sorts of things, including carquestions.ca. You've done forensic work. Uh, YouTube channel, car right. questions, of course. Lots of things. So one quick question for you first is, you know, if you go to a dealership service center and they say to you, here's what we say your maintenance schedule is. You should get your oil changed every 5,000 kilometers. What do you say? Who do you pay attention to? What the dealership service center is telling you or what might be in your owner's manual? No. <laughs> the Bible is and always will be. Yeah. The person who made the car knows the most about it. That's just no two ways about that. They created it. You go by what they say. And they all produce, every one of them, sometimes it's getting harder to find now, but every one of them online, and it should come with the car, of course, but if you buy a used car, there's, there's a problem there. It should come with a specified list of when and what to change on the car. Required, not recommended, required. That needs to be done. You need to do that to fulfill your warranty, and you need to do that in the best interest of yourself and your car. Go to the dealer, it may match up, nine times out of 10, no. It just doesn't. Yeah, and one of the things that we learned in the course of our investigation is that when you see a service advisor at a dealership, they can often be compensated based on how much they sell you, which is an interesting thing for us. Uh, just to reiterate, I'm David Common, and we'd like to say hello to uh, folks in uh, Facebook and on YouTube. We're here taking your questions about cars. Mark knows an awful lot about cars and trucks, so we'll take virtually any kind of question you've got about them, whether it's something specific to your own vehicle, experiences that you've had going into a service center, it might be at a dealership, might be another repair shop, please let us know any sorts of questions that you, you might have, generally speaking. But, you know, Mark, when you think about most cars, people take them into wherever they go to. What are the things that, that you think we're being told most often that maybe don't need to be done? Oh. There's a whole list they've come up with in the last few years. Um, you need your throttle body cleans, you need a fuel injection flush, you need uh, a brake fluid flush, you need a transmission flush. Flushes are very common of any kind. Um, so it's got the word flush in it, maybe be the... Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right off the bat, be very suspect. Uh, they've come up with their own little scheme and uh, they pass it among themselves and it quickly becomes known what sells and they all share that information amongst themselves and it works. Uh, People, you know, you, you need a brake service. Oh, what's a brake service? I mean, change my brakes? They, oh, no, no, no. I mean, your car only has 20,000 kilometers on it. It should be serviced. Well, what's that? Well, we, uh, we take the brakes out and we look at them and inspect them and clean them a little bit and lubricate them and put them back. What? I mean, there's nowhere in the, in the manufacturer's mm -hmm. uh, service advice where it says to take the brakes off the car when they're relatively new, inspect them and clean them. Just have a look at them in case something's gone wrong. Yep. It's rarely the case at that mileage. <clears throat> and uh, you're good to go. But they're selling everybody on these brake uh, services. And it's got nothing to do with honoring the warranty or anything else. But, I mean, people are going for it all the time. Okay, so brakes and flush, that's something to be suspect about. Karen Anderson on Facebook is asking us about the warranty. Is the warranty worth it? I think she is speaking often about those extended care warranties. Well, let's say, Karen, you've got yourself a German car. Yeah. Uh, if you've got yourself or, or other high value car, but mostly those are German. Uh, yes, they are worth it. They are worth it. Because in oft times you buy, you know, uh, off lease, uh, you know, three, four, five year old uh, German car. It's a very expensive car and that attracts a lot of people thinking, hey, this car used to be worth 80, 100K or more. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting it for, whoa, I'm getting it for $30,000. Well, yeah, but those cars really are and it's not a myth. They are more expensive to maintain. You can get a $2,000 a month bill on these kind of things. And if you have this extended warning, you are gonna, there's a very good chance you can save yourself. Um, so I recommend that for that. Other extended warnings, and North American car, mm, you know, it is a profit uh, point for car sales. Uh, a lot of car sales, now just check them. Uh, when you buy the car, if you're buying it new, 
if this is a new car uh, purchase, Karen, if it's got a 100,000 kilometer warranty, you know what, uh, maybe not. American car, um, you know, it, it's iffy, it's 50-50. If you want to, it's probably okay. If it's a Toyota or a Honda or a thing, uh, you know, a Japanese made car or, or the, um, something like that, then, you know, you're buying quality. You're buying a Cura, you're buying a Lexus, something like that, you're buying quality and they come with very good warranties. I wouldn't recommend buying Don't it. Don't buy the extended care warranty in that case. So okay. it, it's car particular, it's manufacturer particular. Helen Dixon was asking a similar question. Helen, I hope we've covered off what you were asking about. Tom Warrington's asking, uh, for what I've noticed, branded dealerships seem to be more efficient and dependable for maintenance needs. Is there any truth to that? Yes and no. Uh, you know, a branded dealer is very good at knowing the basics. Uh, of the average car they sell. They know, uh, they should know yeah. uh, the very basics of it. And then it is very helpful when it comes across certain problems that are very common, that are kind of easy to get to. Uh, you know, for instance, if all, <clears throat> and what I'm referring to is a, like a bit of a defect where they find, uh, you know, when a model of new cars, the wipers are, are loose or, or are falling off the car and they, they quickly find that, they rectify it, and uh, they know that's the cause of noise. So you go to your dealer, and uh, the dealer will know that. Whereas you go to an, maybe an independent shop, they, oh, they might have to fool around a bit, but they'll eventually find it, but the dealer will know. But the dealer, if you bring in a brand new model that just came out that year, and it's the top of the line model usually, you know, uh, for instance, like if it was a Chevrolet, be a Corvette or something like that. If you bring that model in and you have a, and you're one of the first owners and you have a funny problem with the car stalling or making a crazy noise that it should not definitely be making, that dealer's stuck. And nine times out of ten, they have no idea what it was, they haven't seen it before, they don't have any training for it, but as far as the consumer is concerned, yeah. they're, gonna, they're going to say, oh no, no, we'll take care of you, we're, we're good, uh, we'll find it, we'll take care of you for you. A lot of times they can. It goes on for months and months and months and various visits and there's no uh, there's no satisfaction on the part of the consumer. So that's why I say yes and no. Is the dealer the best? No, not in every case. You got a brand new car, you got a brand new Cadillac with all the stuff on it, and you're getting engine codes, and it's a brand new model that year. Don't count on your dealer to count, to fix it the first time you bring it in. I don't think it's going to happen. They're going to not necessarily going to figure it out. Uh, we're uh, live here on Facebook and YouTube, ready to take your car questions, whether it's about warranty or repairs. Uh, dealership experiences, maintenance. Mark Winton, uh, an expert mechanic, does auto safety as an advocate, also knows a lot about sort of forensics, uh, sometimes it does investigations for insurance companies. So he's the guy to ask, car or truck, we're here doing that for you here on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we got questions from Amit and Laura. First, Francesca Mallow is asking, does this kind of information also apply to leased cars? The idea, I think, uh, what Laura's getting at is what we were talking about before, the idea of extended warranties. I hope so, Laura, that's what you're getting at. Well, she might be referring to, hey, I have a, light, a leased car. Mm. You know, what are my obligations under the lease? Yeah. Uh, some of them vary, but generally speaking, your, Francesca, is going to be responsible for the oil change and maintenance. Yeah. So that's tires and brakes and things, depending on how long that lease is for. So she needs to, you know, uh, in lease cases so you don't violate a contract they have the additional legal requirement that they've got to follow the manufacturer's recommendations but if they bring it back to the dealer and the dealer sold to them knows it's leased and starts yeah. telling them oh for your warranty and this you know you need to do uh, you know get your spark plugs changed for warranty and things but the manufacturer says you do not have to for another two three four five years follow the manufacturer and you're not you will never violate that lease never because the lease will never say Excuse me. At least we'll never say that uh, you have to follow the recommendations of the dealer. Right. You have to follow uh, the warranty and service requirements of the manufacturer. They'll always say that. They'll always. So say that. if that's the case, uh, in, in her case, then she should, uh, and she's referring to that because yeah, if you want a lease car, you've got to maintain it. You know, you have to. You're, you're the one who's responsible it, for putting your obligation. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it, unless you have a specific type of lease that says, you know, they pay for all the maintenance. So talking about maintenance, you were telling us before that sometimes when you go into dealership service center, they may try to upsell you on almost anything that has the word flush in it, brake service that isn't actually changing the brakes could be an upsell. But here's a good question from Laura who's asking, is there some something that should be done on a regular, like an annual basis, the things we should say yes to? Yes, there is. 
you should have your car inspected, looked at. Remember, it's looking. Now, I'm not saying you should have something replaced every year, uh, except for in the case of engine oil. Yeah. No matter what your mileage is, you should be changing your oil once a year. There's no two ways about that. Okay. You should be getting it changed. But I mean, you should have your car looked at. It has over 5,000 parts on it. You never know what happens to it. And now that's on top of if the car makes a noise yeah. or, or if a light comes on, etc. For those reasons, you bring but a car. But Laura's going to go in for those kind of things, presumably. What about just that annual maintenance? Because I think some people worry you, you go in for an inspection, they're going to find something, whether you, there's something to find or not. That's, a, that's the worry, right? Absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely true. But so you, what do you say yes to then in that? Well, you have to go in with the knowledge that, you know, my car's new, it's only got 20,000 kilometers. In the first few years, your car is under warranty. They usually require nothing but an oil change and an inspection. Yeah. Almost all cars you could say that about. So I wouldn't go in after two years expecting I need $500 worth of brake service or flushes or anything like that. Yeah. I wouldn't expect that at all. To bring your car in to have inspected, you never know what happens to it. You never know the conditions. People, you know, I've seen everything from you know, squirrels living under the hood to, uh, you know, uh, various other things falling off a car because of defects in manufacturing or recalls that come up, that kind of thing. We got a whole bunch of questions here, so I'm going to try to just rip through them. Amit, we'll go to your question next. Kent, um, we've got a YouTube question. Justin, Sherry, we're going to get to all your questions. Amit, and I, I don't know how quickly we can do these, he says, on my used car, every time I went in for service, they told me to change the transmission fluid. Uh, it seems to him that every single time he needs it. How do I judge when transmission fluid uh, is, is actually needed? You make your model your year car, get out your owner's manual. There's a service component to it. If you don't have it in the car, and many people don't because they buy cars used and that information is just taken out of the glove box, go online and find the stuff. It's there. You can get it. Do what they say. Almost 80% of cars, you should not be changing the automatic transmission fluid. Just leave it. You mean like ever? Uh, no, some cases it is never. In mm -hmm. some cases. Check your manual and, and they'll tell you. But some cases it's never. The car will go for 160,000 kilometers and never, and never once says in the warranty to change the thing. Check the level. Yep. Don't go changing. This fella, he's uh, getting abused a bit. Kent is asking, the, uh, he actually used to work at a dealership and it used to sell something called a Motovac service. He calls it, a, oh, okay, you're laughing. Kent's calling it a complete farce. He wants to know what you think about it, Mark. Motovac? Motovac. Do you know what it is? It's a made up term. That's what it is. Okay. Uh, Motovac. No idea what it is. Uh, are they vacuuming something on the motor? Don't, I don't get it. Don't know what it is. Uh, if he wants to further describe it, sure, go ahead. Okay, Kent, if you've got more details, we'd be happy to hear them, but just based on the name, <laughs> Mark's a little suspicious. Question from YouTube. If a mechanic tells you that something is bad, like your brakes need to be replaced, but you just replace them, is it your right to refuse the service? That's a good question. Absolutely. In any jurisdiction in North America, you have the right to refuse the service that's recommended to you. This isn't surgery on your child. This is a, you know, a consumer item. It's an asset. Somebody wants to do some work, and I say no. Just the same as, you know, I, I don't want my driveway sprayed with the black stuff. I don't want my roof done. Thank you for your advice. I'm going to get a second opinion. Justin, how many, how important are the maintenance schedules in a car's manual? That's an important differentiation between what a dealership might tell you. It's critical and it's the Bible. You do what it says in your service manual by the person who built your car. You do not go by what your dealer tells you. Rob Valla, we've got your question. Sherry Collins is up first. Is it true that auto repair companies will tell you you need an air conditioning recharge, but you don't actually need it? Air conditioning recharge. She's telling you that. So she's asking, is it true that auto repair companies will sometimes tell you you need an air oh. conditioning recharge oh, yeah, when sure. you don't really need it? Oh, absolutely. They'll recommend stuff you don't need all the time. Absolutely. How she, often do you need an air conditioning recharge? What uh, is that? Well, usually air conditioning systems, they're sealed and under pressure. They're as reliable, I'll tell her, as your fridge. Okay. So will it last forever? No. Well, well maybe seven or eight years, it, uh, it starts to you know, run a little hot and you should have a technician look at it? Yeah. Here's the rule. When that air conditioning starts to run hot and is not working, get it checked. Okay. Unless it doesn't, leave it. And in a lot of cars, you can go eight, 10 years. Okay, so if your air conditioning is working, then probably they're not telling you the truth on that one. There's not a lot of maintenance to air conditioning systems. In yeah. fact, there isn't any. Okay. There's nothing you can do. You can't check a fluid level or anything like that. You can just look at it and inspect it, and you push the button and see if it's got cold air. If it does, you're good to go. 
Okay, I'm David Common, a journalist with CBC Marketplace, here with Mark Winton, who's an expert mechanic, both on cars and trucks, an auto safety advocate. He works with carquestions.ca. It's a video blog. You can find it online. We're taking all your questions on YouTube and Facebook. We're very happy to hear them. We're going to try to answer as many as we can. Uh, Rob Bala asks, can dealerships charge an assessment fee even if you have a warranty that covers that issue? No. No, an assessment fee. Again, another made up term and they, they love making up terms. I'd have them describe, what's an assessment fee? A diagnostic? If, say it plainly. Look at your warranty, see what it covers. Um, if it's from the manufacturer, they're the best warranties. They're, yeah. they're aftermarket companies that are, are, are that do work, uh, but some of them are a little sketchy. But uh, if it's diagnostics, should be covered in the warranty. Uh, and they're obligated to do that. I mean, they're just looking for ways to uh, wiggle out of their responsibilities. That's Ma it. Melissa Hamming uh, has a good question for us here. When do you basically stop putting money into an older vehicle? She's using a vehicle that's over 200,000 kilometers. Melissa, is it? Melissa, yeah. Melissa, keep driving that car until you think the value of it is less than $2,500. That's what I would say. Because that's the cost of buying a used car that would pass a safety and an e-test. All right. So no matter what the car is and what age it is, it has to be worth more than $2,500 or, or sorry, less than $2,500 before you decide to get rid of it. If it drives and it's safe, the seat belts and the airbags, uh, check for recalls, of course. If the thing is storming, just keep driving it. I've seen cars go up to 500,000 kilometers and more, so you can be a lucky one. John Gerald McNeil is asking, I have an extended warranty, which is nearing the 100,000 kilometer mark. Um, so you've got a car, I assume, close to 100K. It's got an extended warranty. Can I get all the components and servicing done that is eligible for up to 100K, whether or not it is in need of repair or replacement? So in other words, if the warranty covers him, protects him for, let's just pick something. An engine malfunction. An engine malfunction. He's had this vehicle for two and a half years. He's got an extended warranty. Does that warranty allow him to just go and get that stuff protectively done? No. He needs to go and have it inspected by an independent mechanic to see if any of the issues covered in his warranty yeah. have presented themselves. The car actually has the issue. You're saying go to an independent mechanic? Yes. What a warning will cover is a defect in manufacture or, a, or some kind of failure. Right. If the car is not failing, they have a perfect right to say, no, we're not just going to replace the engine because... But if you go to an independent mechanic, then you've got a record saying there is a problem here before you go if, back to wherever you got the I'm car. just recommending that he has the car examined right. for the issues in case they're a little bit hidden, he can't see yeah. one, right? But I mean, if the me independent mechanic says, yeah, everything's fine, they, and a lot of these ones are just driveline, right? They're just engine, just transmission, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, rear axles. Uh, they don't cover everything, so don't think you're gonna get your tape player, your, your, sorry, tape player, old days. Yeah. Uh, you don't think, go, don't think you're gonna get your GPS you changed out. You don't want out. your Super 8, <laughs> uh, you got an LP rolling on the, on the dash, yes. pull it out, right, okay. But, uh, you know, so in, in his case, just get the car checked, to, uh, as uh, before the warning expires to see if those issues are present. Yeah. If they are, boom. Eight track, not super eight. Sorry, I digress. Yeah, yeah. you got that wrong. <laughs> the, uh, so if there is an issue, away you go. Uh, okay. If not, uh, you know, the warning's gonna expire. Okay, from video and audio, let's talk, uh, take some questions from YouTube. Got three of them here. Most important parts of your car for ensuring safety. Most important part for your car for ensuring safety. Uh, lights, wipers, and tires. Really? I'm surprised well, you, you don't say something. I would have thought brakes would be in there. Brakes, Lights, brakes would be number four, but okay. if you can't see where you're going and people can't see you, you're a target. Okay, <laughs> so, so that's the most important for safety. When, when we think about things that are in the engine or the other components. You know, you know, the top five would be include brakes and steering. If you can't steer your car, you can't stop your car. Uh, technically, in a, in a lot of jurisdictions in Ontario, if uh, for a safety check, if the car doesn't actually... Uh, uh, you know, accelerate that well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It has okay. to accelerate, but not that well. But it's got to be able to stop. It's got to stop, and you've got to be able to see, and you've got to have lights and that kind of thing. Okay, another question from YouTube. My dad's check engine light turned on last weekend. We checked it, and it said cylinder to misfire. Big problem, or can it wait? It could be, but I'd wait. Don't freak out about the, uh, the check engine light coming on, CEL, or it's also called a, uh, a malfunction indicator light, MIL. Don't freak out about that. It's a yellow light. Red lights you got to be worried about. Yellow lights, you, uh, you have some time. Get a check, yes. 
Uh, what I would do in that particular case, if, if they're a little bit do-it-yourself kind of thing, disconnect the negative terminal of the battery, leave it sit for a couple minutes, hook it back up, and see if the light goes out and stays out. If it does, eh, you know, there's glitches in these computer systems. If it comes right back on again, and that's it, and he seems to know the code, yep. so it must be scanning it, then you've got a hard problem and you go through a normal diagnostic step uh, to, uh, to fix it, change, you know, <clears throat> make sure it's got its, uh, it's up to date on its uh, service requirements. Maybe it needs a spark plug change, maybe it's an older car, that kind of thing. Uh, lots of inspections required in diagnostic routine to follow. But don't, don't flip out about it. Um, a misfire on number one, unless the car is running badly and you can feel it, yep. you've got a little bit of time. Uh, it, it's not a panic situation, it's not a red light. Red lights, you panic. I'm David Common here with CBC Marketplace. Mark Winton, we're uh, in his garage. Uh, he is an expert mechanic, cars and trucks, taking your questions, whether it's on service or other things around warranties. Mark's your man. We'll take your questions. Here's one from YouTube. Any advice on anti-rust protection offered by dealers at the time of buying a new car? Now, I know there's a couple of them. There used to be the spray. Increasingly, it's these electronic modules. Your thoughts? Electronic modules? Stay away from them. Okay. It's there's voodoo. Something. And, you know, I've read up on this stuff, and the newest stuff is a little bit different. It's still voodoo. It does not seem to work. But on it the costs chart. a lot of money. Oh, God, yeah. I've seen them charge $800 or more yeah. for the electronic box under your hood. And look at, you know, and, and they'll send you off to a new website. And, oh, and the science all looks good. And they have a, you know, a well-known professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. The car's going to still rust. The best thing, uh, thing to do is, uh, and, I, and I'm you know, not pushing any particular companies ever, but the uh, crown under undercoating where they actually just spray the car with oil. Or, this is old style. Or crown like, where they yeah. just spray the undercoating, that's worth it. And it only costs 100 to 200 bucks. That's worth doing. Okay. If, if, you're, uh, if you're really concerned about your car's rust, and cars last a lot longer now, it depends on your driving habits, but I mean, if, if you're really concerned about preserving your car, that undercar spray by Crown or the Crown-like stuff is your best way to go. Never buy it from the dealer. All right. That's the word from Mark Winton on rust protection. Uh, got questions from Trevor, Myra, Kevin, and Sherry. Trevor up first. Dealerships also have services related to the area of the country and the type of conditions the vehicle drives in. So, you know, as part of the story that we've recently done in Marketplace, we looked at this idea of severe weather conditions. Here we are in Canada, beautiful day today, but it's been known to get cold here every once in a while. Does that alter the maintenance that you need to do on a vehicle? This is the old severe conditions uh, um, thing that we used to face in the 60s and 70s when oils weren't as good as they are today, multi-grade oils and fluids of all kinds. 90% of our population lives at the border. Yeah. Uh, when you're in Arctic conditions, yeah, special conditions apply. Hell, they leave the car running, you know, all day long or the truck 24-7. Uh, but when you're living near the border like 90% of Canadians are, uh, cars have thermostatically controlled cooling systems, which means when you start your car, after it warms up a little bit, it stays at one temperature, just like your house. You know, think of your house, uh, you know, if it has a good heating system and we move it into the northern part of Ontario, it takes a little longer to warm up, but once it's at your set temperature at 23 Celsius or whatever, it stays there. Right. It doesn't matter what the conditions are outside. And it's the same as if you move the house to Windsor. Once the thing got up to 23 degrees Celsius or 22 whatever, it will stay that way. And the cars are thermostatically controlled. So as far as the car knows, it is staying, its engine and its parts are operating at that temperature while you're driving the car. And it doesn't matter that when it's parked, it's a lot colder or that people drive on grid roads, gravel roads, dusty roads. Does that have any impact on it? Well, if you're, and again, most Canadians wouldn't do this, yeah. but if you're driving on gravel roads or off road, uh, you know, gravel conditions, you know, Northern Alberta and things like that. Yes. you know, the car would need to be ex inspected more often. Yeah. And if it is in truly dusty, yes, you probably need more, but it, generally speaking, that is used that severe condition about you know towing a trailer on this applies to commercial vehicles only and severe use in your term into you know, the common use of it yeah. not living in Canada is not considered severe use of a car if you're living in a metro area you live in an urban environment just outside one no this is not severe conditions at all just because it snows here doesn't doesn't mean you should change your oil more frequently. It yeah. just doesn't. You were suggesting that people get their vehicle inspected once a year. Does you get a sense of whether there are problems? Good question from Myra. How much should that inspection cost? Well, 
um, and I have no trouble with people charging for their time. A good inspection of a car, you'd have to bring it in, you'd have to put it up on the hoist, you'd have to take off all the tires, check all the fluid levels, the lights and all the systems, depending on the complexity of the car. And if you want to get into some checking electronic systems and stuff, you could easily spend an hour. Yeah. Most shops are going to charge $100, um, $100 an hour now or more, depending. So I have no trouble with that um, if they want Give to Give me a top out though. Should you be paying 300 bucks for an inspection of a car? No. Should you be paying 200? Um, I would say, you know, you, you should be paying for an hour's worth. An hour's worth of work. Yeah, so, so if... Uh, Whatever they're going in, most places will yeah. actually post what an hourly rate They're costs, supposed right? to, by law, post yeah. what, they, what they charge Certainly for Certainly here in Ontario and many uh, uh, Canadian jurisdictions and other places they may not be required to by law, but uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I assume most places in Canada are similar. Right. Kevin Brimble is asking, uh, does the rear wiper need to be operational to pass a safety inspection? You know, oddly enough, in Ontario, I don't think it has to. Okay, in Ontario, no. You may want to check in your particular jurisdiction. We don't know them for all of them. Well, I'll yeah. tell you, on that, you, you can actually find the, uh, the guideline online in Ontario for safety checks, inspections, and there are a few weirdo things where that's not required. In fact, you don't have to have two, brake, uh, two reverse lights on the car. One. Yeah. Uh, Amit's back. We're going to get to your question, Amit, in a second. Thank you for following up. Nikolai, Nancy, you're coming up next. First, so Sherry, as I serve Banting at, is asking, does getting your own mechanic that you trust to do your standard maintenance on your new vehicle, does that keep the warranty intact? So in other words, not going to the place that you bought the car, going to somewhere else. Yeah, uh, she's, uh, she's highlighted another common uh, uh, scare tactic on the part of dealers. Well, if you take it someplace else, or they suggest to you in a lot of cases, you take it somewhere else, you're gonna violate your warranty because blah, 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 blah. No, you're not. Right. As long as you can prove and, and it's not, you know, uh, you know, the standards aren't ridiculous. As long as you can prove, yes, I had my car brought in for an oil change as required by the car or the mileage, as required by the manufacturer's uh, service recommendations, here's my bills. Right, keep a paper trail. You know, uh, you know uh, Mary's garage, Joe's garage, here's what it says, and it's when I did it. You've got the paper trail, you're good to go. So don't believe the nonsense for the dealer. If you take it somewhere else, it won't be covered. You need to go to the dealer for warranty work. Uh, independent garage can't do that. So if your car is covered under some kind of warning or a recall, can't get it done in independent. You've got to go. And watch that one because if you go to an independent and say, hey, my airbag light's on. They go, okay. And, and they repair the car and they replace the airbag and get the light turned off. That, that might have been a free repair. The garage is not obligated to sell you. They'll charge you for it. You ask them. They'll charge you for it, but this is where knowledge will really cost you if you don't have it. Yeah. That could have been a free repair. Right. So you need to keep up with the recalls on your car because it could cost you. And there's all kinds of recalls, not just airbags, the suspension, engine on tires, you name it. Seems we've never had more recalls now. We haven't, yeah. as a matter of fact. Okay, we go down that road. Sherry, just briefly to answer your question, what Mark Winton, I think, is here saying is certainly you can go to any garage that you trust, any mechanic that you know to get work done on your car. But if you're actually getting the warranty work done, then go back to the dealership, go back to the place. But only if she has car. a warranty problem, she would know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, Nancy Louise, how good are the diagnostic programs that are sold on, online? Uh, and Nancy says, I had a sensor light that was persistent in lighting up, spent a pretty penny before I learned it was a computer glitch. So basically she's asking, how good are the diagnostic programs that you can buy online? I think uh, she's referring to diagnostic scan tools yeah. that you can get. Um, and uh, they vary from very cheap, uh, you know, costing less than $100 or less than $60 to thousands. Oh, really? Professional ones are thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, the professional ones really work well, uh, but you need a little bit of training to use them. They're not for the average person. Um, how well do they work? It's hit and miss. I'm going to say that. Yeah. Hit and miss. Um, You're investing a little bit of money in the hopes of saving a lot more. Right? I think it's, it's a great idea she did this. Having the ability to read your own computer. I mean, we're living, you know, this is the 21st century. Yes, we should be able to hook up the thing to a car in the car if it has a computer that has codes in it. We should be able to read them just like anybody else and yeah. just tell my technician, hey, it's got code P0127. You know, we should be able to know that. And, uh, you know, and, and hats off to her for doing that. Uh, but the, the higher level of uh, scan tools 
And uh, actually, I've got one right here. Of course he has one right here. This is Mark Winton, who's an expert mechanic, uh, both on cars and trucks. We're here taking your questions on Facebook and YouTube, so please do keep them coming. Talking about diagnostic sensors, here's Mark with one right now. Well, it's uh, this is a, a mid-price one, but I mean, they just, all cars have that connection. Yeah. And you stick it right in, and you turn the car to on, not start usually. Hit the button, and it will read these codes from various systems of, uh, in the car. Yeah. Engine, brake systems, transmission sometimes. And it's very good to have. And uh, you can spend, you know, buy a very cheap one, of course, and get the basics of it. It's a good idea to have it. Um, again, if you get into a, a problem, she refers to a glitch. You can get any of these problems where the computer systems come up with these codes all the time, and they, you know, you think they're super sophisticated. Eh, the coding or, mm -hmm. or how the program was, uh, was uh, transpired is just a little too sensitive and it keeps coming up with codes when in fact the car is running fine, there's nothing wrong with it, except the computer keeps saying that. That does happen and I think that's what she's referring to. And unfortunately for her, that's, that's uh, somewhat common on some cars. I can think of a few that bring up codes all the time and, and the car is running fine. It's too bad, Nancy. I mean, it sounds like uh, you and other people may be in this same boat. I don't know if that... To totally answers it in the way that you'd hoped it would. Um, we've got a lot more questions here. Uh, Amit, you're still there. Greg, you're, you've come in. Nikolai is asking how often should, well now this is an interesting one, headlight fluid be replaced? <laughs> so, okay, Amit, Nick, uh, Nick, uh, gotta no, no, Nikolai, yeah. Nikolai, Nikolai. got to tell you, there is no such thing as headlight fluid and, yeah. and it's, a, uh, you know, it, it's a well-known joke in the industry when they when they make jokes about car repair that they sell people this kind of thing, unfortunately. Uh, that is a joke. There is no such thing as headlight fluid. All right. So let's move on to Amit, who's come back. Thanks uh, again, Amit, for coming back. He said, I once had a breakdown and the dealer charged me twice for diagnostic because they took longer to find out the issue. Is that normal? Here's what I'm going to say to that, and that happens a lot. And, and that's unfortunate. It shouldn't happen. Here's the deal. You bring your car in and say, this is wrong with it, or it stopped, bring it in, find out why it stopped. Tell the person in no uncertain terms, I am paying you to tell me what's wrong with this car, not guess, right? I'm paying you to fix my car, this rattle, not guess. So for instance, I don't bring it in and say, my car is rattling, you'd be so well, we suggest this and this and this, and you get the car back the next day, still rattling. I go, Hey, and then, and then you go back and say, it's still rattling. Well, no, it's not that, it's this now. No, 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 I did not pay you the first time to try to fix it. I paid you to fix it. So if your diagnosis is good, spend all the time you want diagnosing the car. Get the problem. If you don't know, say so. I'll go someplace else. And, uh, you know, that's where that dealer comes in. You know, if you bring it to the dealer, you think they should know, and lots of times they don't. It's their own brand. Say, look, I bring this car in. Tell me what's wrong with it, and I'll pay you to fix it. I'm not paying you to try and fix it. There you go, Amit. So it does happen. You're not the only one. That was a lot. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't happen. Uh, uh, Neelish, uh, Mark, Bren, we've got your questions. Greg, you've been patient. If I use both all seasons and winter tires, do I need to have either of them balanced? So I guess he's saying, you know, like you run six months on one tire mm -hmm. or eight months on one type of tire and then four months on the other or whatever. Do you actually need to have them balanced every single time? Simple answer. You have a set of tires for your car, winter, summer, need them balanced, both sets. You don't have to get them rebalanced all the time, but you need, when you buy tires, you get them balanced. No two ways about it. My dad was not a big believer about this in mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s, and the car used to shake on the highway. All it does is wear out your suspension components. No, you want a nice smooth ride. It's legit. It's a, you know, a technicality. You buy tires, whether winter, summer, or any other kind, get them balanced. Done. You got two sets. You got two now, sets of balance. Are you doing that balancing work every single time that you're no. you're swapping off? No, 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 no. Once you buy the tires and yeah. have them put on rims, yeah. the person balances them up. They're good to go. What uh, if you don't have rims? What if you don't? You know, what if you oh, only have one set of rims? Well, that's a good one. A good, a good thing you pointed that out. Yeah. If you have to keep taking the tires off, they're loose, as they call them in the industry, where they're not on a rim, and you have to have them fitted. So you have to take the rim off, you have to take off the summer tire, you got to put on the one. Every time you get them put on, they need to be balanced. No matter. So at that point, then the rims start becoming a little bit more, make more sense to buy a second That's set why of rims. Exactly. That's why people buy a set of tires with rims. Yeah. They're already balanced. All you have to do is take that tire, put it on the car, you're done. But if you've got a loose tire with no rim on it and you keep changing it, that's not particularly good for the tires because the tires, uh, there's damage can occur when you're taking them off and on. So if you had a set of tires, winter yeah. tires, that 
you had for five or six years and you were taking them off every year. And tires shouldn't be taken off and put on a six times, not a good idea. Uh, but if you were doing that, you need to have them balanced each and every time. Neelish, you're asking, what's the difference between synthetic engine oil and others? That's a good question. Which one is recommended for newer cars? Also, is it true that there's no going back once you use synthetic? Okay, you can go back and forth, no problem. You can mix synthetic oil with regular oil. Some people call it dino oil, dinosaurs. Okay. Um, but, you uh, mean the original oil? Yeah, the original okay. oil, it's yeah. non-synthetic. Uh, but non-synthetic oil, you can mix it. Uh, you can mix both with either one. Synthetic oil is a better grade of oil, no two ways about that. It's more stable at low and high temperatures. So as uh, oil tends to uh, act a little goofy at lower and higher temperatures, it gets too thick or it gets too thin. And a synthetic is very stable mm. at, at those temperatures. So it is a better oil. Uh, your car will specify, again, look what the manufacturer says. If it says it has to have synthetic, and some do, especially higher end cars, they will tell you exactly which one. Um, just pick a, you know, a major name brand. It says the thing is synthetic. Use that, you're good to go. If your car doesn't need synthetic, well, you don't need it. I've never seen a car ever fail because someone uh, you know, uh, uh, was told to use regular oil and they, and they did and the car failed and they thought, oh well, it wouldn't have failed if you put in synthetic. No, 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 the car would have had a failure for another reason. We're here with you on Facebook and YouTube. We're gonna try to race through the questions. We've got lots of them. I hope we're able to, hope we're answering the, the questions that you've got. Um, Mark uh, Giardino, is asking how common is it for a dealership to not be able to balance tires due to tire size? I would go to another dealer. Usually, the, you know, there's a tire person in town that has a tire business that, spa yeah. that goes, and they will have the newest equipment. A lot of times, the major problem is that they're scratching the rims. Uh, they don't have the, you know, there's a lot of differences in the tire changing equipment. You got old stuff, don't go. Uh, don't go to that place. Uh, so, and dealerships may or may not have it. If you go to high-end dealerships, BMW, Mercedes, they'll have very high-end rims and very high-end tires. They usually have the latest tire changing equipment and so would the biggest tire uh, retailer in town, independent tire. Go to them um, and have your tires uh, uh, changed there. Uh, if someone says they can't balance your tire because of size and if it's off a regular car or truck, don't go there. Okay, don't go there. They don't have the right equipment. Mark, that's pretty plain. Bren Ann is asking, does bad rust on a rocker panel make a car fail of safety? Yes, a lot, oh, of, really? a lot of mechanics will say, uh, if you look at the guideline closely, it's gonna be a judgment call. But I, if you have rust in those areas, you generally have rust in a lot of hidden areas under the car, brake lines, fuel lines, and all these kinds of things. I've gotta say, unfortunately, her case, with a car that's showing that much rust on the outside, Generally speaking, there's not a very good chance it could pass the safety. All right. Sorry. Sorry, that is not good news. Um, Zach White, what what mark do you think of 3M clear wraps for protecting against rocks and salt? It's an actual product. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I think that's a great idea. This yeah. is, it's a plastic wrap in a car. It gives it another skin. Um, uh, you can you can find YouTube videos on this stuff. I think it's a great idea. I absolutely think it's a great idea. It's just a protective coating. Uh, years ago in the 70s and 80s, we used to put those big vinyl uh, bras on the front of the cars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and this, this protective coat is, of course, very thin and uh, color-coded, color match sometimes. Do you go over the whole car? You know what? They actually can skin a whole car now. Yeah. Uh, but, but generally, they just do the, you know, the sides uh, that are lower down that get the rocks kicked up out the rocker panels, quarter oh, yeah. panels, that kind of thing. The front end, of course. The front of your car gets most of the damage because its face is in the wind. So that's the thing. Anything that's got a frontal... Uh, uh, area to it, that's what gets pummeled. You know, I remember talking to uh, guys who do rust research and they said that there's a big difference between auto paint today compared to even 10 years ago. The layers of it, the way it, it is installed, and so it's that much stronger against rust in particular. Uh, Not necessarily chips. I wouldn't say it was the paint so much as the steel underneath it. The oh, yeah. high strength steel, galp steels, those are more responsible for the lack of rust in cars. The coatings they're putting on the tubing, things like that, uh, types of tubing they're using, those are far more uh, responsible for the length of a car's age than the actual paint coating. Paint coatings have changed a lot uh, for fade resistance and things like that, but also for environmental reasons. Debbie, you got a question about your 2011 Ford Escape, an issue with a sensor. They hooked it up to diagnose it and said Debbie's car needs to be updated, or the car computer rather needs to be updated. They wanted the charger for this. Is it normal? She refused. Uh, in this case, Debbie needs to go online 
and search her problem. Use whatever terms they've told you, mm -hmm. search those terms. Flashing a car's computer is as common as flashing a regular computer. You have to update, you know, the computer says it's got to update. Car's computers need this too. Yeah. And they refer to it as flashing. And um, we don't have access to do that like as an owner. We should, but we don't. Yeah. So you're dependent on the dealer, not independent. Uh, the dealer, you got to go to the dealer and you have to do it. If she's experiencing a particular problem and they guarantee her that is the fix, that makes it kind of like a manufacturer's defect. Hey, it wasn't because she didn't wash the car. You know, it's an, it's an update in the software. How was that my problem? Yeah. You know, that, so check for recalls right off the bat in case it's covered by a recall. Argue that fact that, hey, this is not my problem, uh, you know, and see if it's safety related. Is it making a safety light come on and then you've got a bit of an argument there. Let's, you fix this, this car for me. It's your issue. Now, if her car is running properly, there is no issues and there's no recalls and they tell her she needs a computer flashed, don't do it. Leave it. And Debbie did refuse. She said she didn't do it. Good for her. As All long right. as her cars run okay, there's no lights on. We're here on Facebook and YouTube, so let's take a question from YouTube. What type of brake pads are the best for cold winter weather? Oof. Uh, there's lots of debate about uh, it, it, when you get specific about parts like that. Just use what the uh, uh, manufacturer suggested. You go to a parts place. If you're doing it yourself, the parts person will recommend a set of brake pads for it. Use them. Just use that. There, there is usually a, uh, um, a choice where you can go, you know, a level higher. Go ahead if you want to. See if you, uh, see if you get results with it. If you do, you're happy with it. It's one of those things where you have to test it yourself. Uh, I haven't found, generally speaking, I can't walk up to a car and say, oh, yeah, it's got that kind of pads on it. Or, excuse me, you know, they, they last that long and I always recommend this. I can't say that. In 35 years of being a mechanic, I wish I could. I just can't. So, yeah. you know, it's a bit of a hit and miss thing with that. Mark Quinton is an expert licensed mechanic, both cars and trucks, uh, car uh, and auto safety repair advocate, taking your questions. Mark, Devin, Mike, will, and uh, Harpo will get to your questions. Brent Ann back with us. What happens with radiator fluid when it's mixed old with new? Uh, I've had a small dealer do this. I've heard it can be reactive and, and therefore not cool. If you put in this same uh, coolant and you know this car you'd have to know the history of the car yeah as long as you put in the same coolant it came with you're good to go uh, best what thing do you mean by same same brand same oh, oh, type it's got to be the same type doesn't yeah. have to be the same brand has to be the same type uh, as long as it's the same type there's only a couple different types so you can't really goof it up uh, but there's only a couple different types as long as you use the, the type they're recommending mm. you're good to go would you flush it uh, change it completely again follow the manufacturer's recommendation every eight years, six years, some of these are lifetime coolants that they use now and most people aren't flushing them and changing them and uh, are getting a lot of use. The and idea that the current. old and new can be reactive, truth to that? Um, no, you're just diluting, you're just diluting the old stuff mm. with the new stuff but there are, there are properties of the coolant that help lubricate water pump uh, seals and this kind of things. So if, if that's your aim is to update your cooling system, you probably want to change all of it, not mix it. But if you're, you know, just, you had a small leak because you, ha you had a small a whole, uh, leak in a hose or something and you mm -hmm. found it and you fixed it and you go, oh, I just need to add a liter, go ahead, mix it, you're good to go. Mark Giardino has got something. Is road force balancing better than regular balancing? Um, uh, there's a debate over that, but I I've seen the machines that they use uh, at the, uh, again, the German uh, car dealerships, mm -hmm. and these things are absolutely unbelievable. I'm, I'm left with the impression it's German cars. Oh, no, no. no. Uh, well, I love German cars. I love all cars, really. But, I mean, they're, they're, they have consequences <laughs> for a mechanic. It's minimal. For yeah. an average person, it's a lot. But uh, the equipment they have, because of the complaints they get, yeah. With tires and things. They, they, and, and, uh, so what is road force balancing? Oh, it's, it's where they put pressure on the tire and they do it on the car. They used to do it in the 60s, actually. So they make it like it is on the road uh, as it's, opposed it's, to just in the garage. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's more of a simulated, yeah. uh, you know, a reality-based tire balance. Yeah. Um, is it better? I don't think so. I, I like the one on the, I like the, the machines I've seen and the printouts they can do on the high-end ones where you're actually removed from the car. I've never seen, uh, it'd be tough to top that, but some people are saying it's great. Another good specific question here from Devin Gall. How often do you have to change muffler bearings? <laughs> Again, another made up term. Right. There's, there is no such thing as a muffler bearing. Sorry about that. So same with headlight fluid. Oh yeah, same category. Uh, Mike Kowalchuk, what extra maintenance is there behind owning a hybrid? 
He's looking to buy a uh, Ford Fusion 2011 hybrid. Uh, when, you, when you buy a hybrid, there's a lot more uh, checking through the computer system than there is, you know, obviously looking for oil leaks. Uh, but hybrids do have engines. So it's not all electric, it's a hybrid, so you have to check the engine, see mm. if, just like any other thing is, has it got the coolant, has it got a leak, is there any engine oil issues, does the engine itself have any issues. Uh, as far as the battery, the most things you need to check on that, it's not maintenance, it's warranty. Is this thing covered on a long-term warranty I don't know about? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are. A lot of the hybrid cars, the batteries are covered for 10 years. Oh, really? But okay. the kind of, when you're the second owner, some of this information gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So that is the stuff you need to concentrate on. What about the battery? You know, am I responsible for the battery when, when it comes time to change it? Uh, is there a discount? The batteries often come bundled with a computer that monitors its charging. You've got to change that too. It can get super expensive. But see, a lot of the manufacturers have warranty the hybrids. Uh, the batteries in them specifically for a long period of time. See if that warranty is transferable. That's the thing you need to concentrate on. So I drive a hybrid. It's eight years old. Yep. I, I don't think we've ever had any difference in the maintenance because of this. We've had gas-powered cars before this. In fact, we've basically done nothing. Yeah, it's still a gas-powered car. You still get still a gas-powered yeah. car. Yeah. Right. So you're the first owner. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to worry about it. The next person does. But you probably have quite a, a quite a, a warning on that battery that you might be unaware of. Well, actually, I didn't even think that it might be covered for about 10 years. So uh, I'm learning something, too. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'm learning a lot. Uh, Mike, I hope that answers your question about your 2011 Ford Fusion hybrid potential. Harpo, what do you think about maintenance packages? That's the question. When you buy the car new? Assuming so, yeah. Uh, well, again, if it is a... Uh, a German car, highly recommended, and uh, you know the you know the uh, top five would be in a BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, Audi, and Volkswagen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, get it because first really? three years, oh yeah, first three years, car runs like a dream. After that, it starts having issues, and absolutely recommend with that. You're, if you're buying top of the line Japanese Lexus, Acura, things like that, not so much. I, I you know it's, if you want to go ahead, but I think it'd be a bit of a money grab buying an American car. Yeah. I would do it. Flip a coin. Sometimes American stuff's good reliability. Some I think years, sometimes some years people go there. into a dealership, whether you're buying it new or used, and they sit there and say, "Oh God, do I really want to pay three thousand or two thousand or however many thousand dollars more for this, or add an extra fifty bucks on my monthly payment?" Absolutely, it's a, it's it's profit center for them. That's why they sell it. Um, you know, they don't. Uh, it's that's what it is. And so there is a lot of profit in it. Does it save people? Again, if you, I've seen people who have used these warranties quite successfully, mm. again, with the foreign manufactured cars and, and domestics as well. Um, but, you know, when it starts to get, when you start paying more than $1,500 or, you know, $2,000 for an extended warning, you're going past, what, you know, shop around, see if you can get a better price. Oh, really? Okay. You know, don't buy from the dealer, buy from somebody else. Carly Ann and uh, Legaspi, we're going to get to your questions. Matt's up first. Why do different provinces in Canada allow front window tint? And can this fail me on an inspection? Um, why, they, why the province is different in laws is, is completely subjective. Each province gets to do what it likes. There's no federal uh, requirements on this except for Canadian motor vehicle safety standards. When the cars are new, they, they can only have a certain amount of tint on them. In Ontario now, they actually put a meter against the window on a safety check mm -hmm. that'll actually uh, you know, shine a light through it like spectrometry and see what, the, see what it is. And it has to be... You know, the, the two side windows and the front windshield have to be visible. The back one can be completely black if it likes, but I mean, it, it has to uh, have a certain level. Um, why they do that? Um, you got to watch it. You really have to watch. So if you're getting your windows tinted, make sure it's legal in the province you're in. Because you could fail an inspection, you're saying. Yeah, you can fail an inspection over it. Yeah. It's very uncommon that the police will pull you over for it because I think even uh, in some cases, politicians' cars have these uh, dark windows that are a little too dark. Last time I saw one, oh, uh, right. that according to our laws, although it's on a, on a, a member's car, yeah. and, and I'm talking a government car. Yeah, they, so are they going to get pulled over, right? Yeah. Okay, Car uh, Carly Ann, are uh, the codes that come up on my car from the manufacturer, um, or is this a way for a dealership to make you come back for unnecessary maintenance? 
So are, are the codes that come up in my car, I feel like there's maybe a word missing in the translation. Yeah, I think she I means, here, yeah. again, this is maybe somebody who's got a scan tool. When they talk about codes, they're talking about hooking their car up to the computer and getting a code. There are a few cars in the market that might tell you a code without hooking up a scan tool. Yeah. Very rare. But uh, if she's referring to that, she's checked her own codes. Um, uh, if it comes up, the car has a legitimate issue. Uh, it can be, uh, mostly it's not an immediate uh, you know, I've got to take it in and my car will blow up. I've got to shut the car off and get it towed. No, mm -hmm. you can usually drive it and, and take care of it. But um, other than that, um, some cars share common codes. They'll have a defect in its design or manufacturer or assembly in some cases. And you'll know somebody else with the same Model X car that has exactly the same problem. That's very common. I recommend go online, type in your make, your model, type in your codes and see what other people are saying. Okay, Carly Ann, that, uh, maybe you've already tried that. Uh, that's a suggestion from Mark. Mark, of course, is um, an expert licensed mechanic, both cars and trucks. We're uh, streaming to you here on YouTube and Facebook today. I'm David Common with CBC Marketplace. We've been looking at uh, dealership service centers and the upsell that you might get there. Uh, Legaspi is asking about buying another set of tires for winter. How well will it work with the car tire pressure monitoring system with a new set of tires? Now, this is a good one. It depends on the rims, right? Are you, are you sticking it on the existing rims? What happens? You well, this is, this is probably the single biggest issue people have with buying and purchasing winter snow tires. They put them on their car, and the, one of the biggest issues is, hey, this light's on my dash now, and it says my tires look, pressure's all wrong. Yeah. That'll happen about half the time. Some of the cars have these tire pressure monitors devices, and they're little RF uh, yeah. devices right inside the rim, right on it. So if you don't use that same rim, and you buy new rims with new tires, you've got to put that little monitor in it, and that's expensive. That gets that really starts to cost you money, and of course balancing the tire and all that stuff. You do that fine. Other car companies and newer and and, and as time goes on, they're more they're uh, they're adopting this. They're not using that sensor in the wheel anymore. Okay. In, in, in the rim. They're just, you know, monitoring the rotation of the tire through other means in the car and it's got nothing to do with the tire in the rim. And, and they're good to go. And those cars, no problem. They don't know what kind of tire is on them. And those, uh, those issues don't come up on those cars. You won't get the uh, tire inflation. I will say, you know what, check the spare tire. A lot of times after five, six years, it loses pressure. It's got a monitor in it and it causes a ghost problem. And people go, I checked all four tires. It's look still fine, yeah. It looks fine. Check that spare. So I will say do that. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have this issue where you've bought the tires, you did, it, the your original ones were supposed to have the monitor in them, you don't have it, doesn't matter. Just pretend you're, this is 1980. Just make sure you've got 30 pounds of uh, air in there, 250 kil uh, uh, kilopascals, 225 kilopascals. Make sure you have the right amount of air in your tires, you're good to go. So the light's on, you know it, you know the reason for it, just don't have the sensors. So it's, you're perfectly good, good to go, it won't affect the rest of the car and uh, happy motoring, but uh, the light will be on. Kate and Aiden, you're uh, coming up in just a second. Cindy Connors right first, and she's asking, uh, how often, if ever, should you get a brake fluid flush? Again, this is an easy one. You check your manual for the car. The manufacturer tells you, change the brake fluid or flush it, go ahead. But most manufacturers just say, check the level. Okay. They tell you to change it, you do. If your service manual uh, with your car doesn't tell you to change it, don't change it. But I mean, if you keep your car an extraordinary length of time, 15 or 20 years, yes, pretty much everything on the car should have been changed at some point, right? Okay, but give me an idea. I mean, for Cindy here, if, if her car's at 100,000 kilometers, is a brake fluid flush usually necessary? No, but I've got, say, David, the, the average age of a car now in Canada is like 9.4 years. Yeah. So that's getting up there. So, you know, sh should you change The some? average age or the length, the average lifespan of a car? No, no, the average age of it. The average age of a car in Canada is 9.4 years. It's about 9.4 years. It's higher down the States. So that means a lot of people are driving cars that are... 10 years old. Or older. Yes. If that's the average. Mm -hmm. How old is your car? Uh, eight, uh, eight, nine years, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm average. <laughs> Kate, you're asking, how soon after you buy a new car do you need full maintenance? Kate's got a Kia Sorento with 19,000 on it. Bought it at the end of March. Here we are, end of September. Kate, that car has had one oil change on it done so far. Maybe two. Uh, you know, you're changing oil at around 10,000 kilometers on that car. Um, 
again, it doesn't need a major service. It needs the service that Kia says in its service manual. And it's probably not major at 19K. We're looking at a lot of look, 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 inspect, inspect, inspect. No changing, no replacing, no lubricating. But frankly, at I mean, usually, 19K, I mean, should you even be going and paying for the diagnosis, the look, the again, inspection? Again, you might want to have your car checked once a year, but you can get that done at your oil change. You know, yeah. can, can She's you not even, Kate's not even at a, a year here. This is, uh, you know, March, April, May, June, July, August, it takes six months. Yep, yeah, she could have worn out wiper blades, and you know, you don't want to replace that kind of stuff, or a burned out light. Lights can bl uh, burn out anytime. So, yeah. uh, but she can check that stuff herself. So. Uh, a lot of the inspection and looks you can do yourself. You know, beep your horn, put on the wiper blades, uh, check the lights, have somebody help you with that kind of, a lot of checks you can do yourself that they do. Yeah. But at 19K, Kate, you should be spending nothing uh, but uh, air for the tires and uh, an engine oil change. Uh, Aiden is asking, is it common for dealers to use aftermarket parts? Is it better to use branded parts? Many dealerships seem to suggest that it is. Does it affect the vehicle if you use aftermarket parts? Um, two questions there. Uh, yeah. the, the dealer will do whatever in their uh, best interest uh, profit-wise. Uh, so if they have to do a job under warranty, if an aftermarket part is much cheaper, they'll use it. And they'll tell you that's fine, that's their prerogative, and it is, sorry. Um, are they, uh, you know, generally speaking, are, are uh, OEM parts, they're called, original equipment manufacturer. Is it better to buy a, a new Toyota part or a new GM part for your GM car or your Toyota car? No, uh, I don't think so. It's not been my practice. Look, if, if the part of the car failed uh, prematurely, that's prematurely, if it failed prematurely and it was made by GM or it was made by Toyota, it's an official part, I wouldn't trust it. I would give somebody else, another manufacturer, a shot. Mm -hmm. Like, why would I patronize the same company who, who made the defective part twice? Once, okay. Twice, no. So, um, are aftermarket parts better or worse? You can find aftermarket parts that are much better than originals. Sometimes they're exactly the same, sometimes they're worse. But uh, Are they often cheaper? Oh, they're almost always cheaper. Yeah. Almost always. But, you know, here's my rule of thumb. If a part lets you down, do not buy it from the same person again. Buy another, give another maker a chance. Well, because that, that why would, would seem you? to rule out a lot of the branded parts, wouldn't it? Well, if the branded parts failed as a result of being defective in the design or manufacture, you know, they had developed a crack when they weren't supposed to, you know, if they fell apart because, you know, a tree fell on it or, or, or something else or obsessive use, then it's not the manufacturer's fault, and then you might want to buy the same stuff again. But, uh, you know, wiper blades or something right, along those lines, if they wore out too quickly, you know. Mark Winton here, expert licensed mechanic, cars and trucks. I'm David Common with CBC Marketplace taking your questions here today on YouTube and Facebook. Question coming in from Danielle, who's asking, what's the deal about lifting trucks? I've heard about stuff where the truck can be over seven feet high. Is that true? Uh, what's the deal on that? This is someone who's obsessed with uh, trucks and off-roading. And it's a sport for some people. Yeah. It's very common in the States. Not so common here in Canada, but you do see it. You see, you'll see a pickup truck and it's got like humongous mutter tires on it. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this thing could go through a hurricane. And oddly enough and ironically enough, those things are great in those conditions that they just had, like in, in Irma and stuff. Those are the only ones you saw driving around. Yeah. The crazy people with these high-level vehicles. With these yeah. high-level vehicles. They're the same as military trucks. Yeah. And if that happens and you live in a flood zone and you have one of those cars, I'm thinking, I need to be friends with that person. That's what I'd be thinking because those things would be very useful. Day to day, you're living on southern Ontario, your southern part of Canada, uh-uh, not a good idea. When you start to do all this stuff, it, you know, if you're doing it for, uh, you know, just reasons to keep yourself busy or, or amuse yourself, go ahead, but it's very expensive. But if you think this is helping the car or adding value, it doesn't. Uh, and when you lift the car, they were never meant to be lifted like that. So you actually start to wear out drive shafts and U-joints because these angles in the car start to change for the suspension. Mm. That they were never meant to go this, this high. And they start to wear out all kinds of pro uh, parts. And it's very expensive. I'm just thinking seven feet. I'm six foot two. That means that I could stand in the middle of a road and nothing could drive right over me. That's pretty excessive, seven feet. That's a monster truck. Monster, yeah. But, uh, I mean, you see these ones all the time. They're lifted three 
two, three feet off the ground. They have yeah. these monster tires that come down the road. You can hear them coming at you because the tires are, have su such big lugs. Are those things great in disasters? Yeah. Uh, are Speaking of lugs, is it a legal requirement to get truck nuts if you've got a truck lifted seven feet off the ground? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go on to other stuff. Danielle, I hope that answered it in some way. Uh, Bruce, Bob, uh, we'll come to you in just a second. Isaac, you're asking, when looking at buying a used truck, is there a kilometer point where things potentially could start to go wrong, particularly around the transmission? It would be hard to generalize for every manufacturer out there. I mean, there's been, you know, some car, some, uh, 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 some truck manufacturers through the years have had transmission problems at a very early stage. So it'd be very tough to answer that one. You know, generally speaking, when you're buying a truck uh, or car, low mileage, clean condition, that's your best one. Yeah. Regardless of make, get the best price at the lowest possible mileage and the, and the best possible condition. Keep an eye out now that we were just talking about the uh, Hurricane Irma and uh, uh, the other things that have happened in Florida with Harvey and whatnot. You know what? Keep an eye out if you're in the southern U.S. Uh, keep an eye out for people passing oh, yeah. these cars off because there was hundreds of thousands of cars that will be coming on the market uh, that could have issues. So and it's not just, I mean, we're talking about vehicles that got flooded out and they dry them out. And uh, there's various. We saw it after Hurricane Sandy. A lot of those vehicles and from New York State ended up crossing the border into Canada. And there's various degrees of flooding. Yeah. Some just got a little bit wet somewhere right to the roof yeah you know so there's various degrees so it's it's uh, now it's more important than ever uh, if you're thinking of getting a car and you're anywhere in the united states have it checked out very thoroughly for any kind of flood related damage kilometer mark though is the question which i mean hundred thousand um <laughs> Did they put it on in a year? If they put it 100,000 kilometers on in a year, it's, eh, you know, cars are generally good for 300,000 kilometers. Okay. Uh, this know, is a truck we're talking about. Would you say roughly the same Again, uh, you know what? The lower mileage, the better. I don't want to put a number on it. I want to say 100,000 is a cutoff point for transmission failures. Uh, I don't want to say that. Um, it's not the way you would go about uh, evaluating the truck in general, because so yeah. many other things could fail. Why would you just point to the transmission? Bruce Gourley uh, asking, is doing a transmission flush important? Bruce, if the manufacturer recommended doing it, yes. So if you see it in the owner's manual. In the service requirements of the owner's manual, yeah, do it. If it doesn't say it, don't do it. This is a case of sometimes we're better left alone. Often the if word it, flush seems to be a trigger for you. Oh yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's very suspect in my book when they start saying flush. Don't do it. Uh, make sure the level is full. Check the level. But if your manual doesn't say that that car, the make and model and year that you have, needs a flush, don't do it. Check the level only. Debbie and Mary, we'll get to you in a second. Bob asking, is nitrogen in your tires worth it? <laughs> No. Uh, okay. You want to take your car to the racetrack? You want a Ferrari? Go ahead. Put nitrogen in your tires. It's an absolute waste of money. There's just absolutely no way you can prove they put nitrogen in your tires. It's not like you can see this stuff. And, uh, you know, half those nitrogen things at, at, at the dealerships aren't functioning or they're broken and they tell you there's nitrogen in it. And I cannot, again, tell from repairing a car over 35 years, take the tire off, look at the rim. Oh, yeah, this one had nitrogen. Look how clean it is. No, you can't tell. It's, that's all nonsense. All right. Question from YouTube. Does the engine function the same when you accidentally filled the tank with diesel on gasoline cars, even if it got flushed out? So can you have, let's say you accidentally fill a car with diesel, mm -hmm. but it's a gasoline vehicle. Yeah. Got it all flushed out. Yeah. Are there long-term consequences? I'm going to say the cameraman that, just fell down. It's all right. We don't, we're no, he's, he's good. All right? He's good. It's a stool. It's a stool. Call it's first a, there was a malfunction, but we're all good. I would say, yeah, uh, happens. Uh, with regards to the diesel and stuff, if uh, you put the uh, diesel in a gas car and you flush it out, just keep driving it, just keep filling it. Fourth or fifth tank, there should be no sign of the stuff left in the system. <clears throat> and uh, cross your fingers, I'm thinking it's going to be OK. I can't think that it's going to damage any particular components. The diesel fluid isn't as, uh, uh, as corrosive as gasoline, generally speaking, to the, to the uh, components in a fuel system. Um, but uh, you never know. It could, it could uh, damage O2 sensors in the car and a few other sensors. So it could have some damage to the car. But after the fourth or fifth tank, 
if uh, codes haven't cleared and the engine lights are still on, you have to go to the codes and if it says you got an O2 sensor problem, malfunction or something like that, you might have to change an O2 sensor. After four or five tanks, if there's no lights on in the car and things run out fine, you're good to go. Debbie's pointing out something here and it's you're absolutely making a good point. We're doing this in part because CBC Marketplace has done a story looking specifically at dealership service centers and the, the instances in which they may upsell you on maintenance that you don't require or don't require at that particular time. Debbie's pointing out it's important to state that it's not just dealerships, that that could include those quick oil change companies, that tire places, independent garages could be in the same boat. Absolutely that's the case. Debbie, uh, just by way of explanation for Marketplace, we get a lot of our story ideas this way from people who write into us, who engage with us, and we heard a lot specifically about dealerships which is why you know that particular part of the pie was what we looked at but Mark I think you would agree that there are good players out there and not good players and uh, you know yeah, you it's mostly filled with not good players All right. but there are some good ones um, and her point is well taken um, it's not it's not like you can go just go to independent garages they're all great yeah and they won't try to give you a flush or upsell you they will she's right about that okay Mary, um, is there a time limit to get recall work completed? That's a tricky one. Um, yes, uh, but it's usually a, about a decade. Generally, really? okay. yeah, it's usually they they stop. They will stop honoring recalls at some point. It costs them an awful lot of money. It costs them in the millions, sometimes the billions. When you're talking Takata airbags. So yeah, um, generally speaking, though, for the average car owner, if your car is recall, it should be going to a dealer, and it is a free. Fix, and I mean free. I don't mean they charge you for the diagnosis, charge you for driving the car in or whatever. Yeah. It's free. Demand they do the recall, demand it gets done. Especially if you have a Takata airbag, those things are killers. Yeah, and that is the largest recall in automotive history. Absolutely. Takata airbag, it's, and they're in all sorts of vehicles, all sorts of model years. They're in everything. Absolutely everything. Hey, here's a good question um, from Sylvie about uh, oil changes. So. Sylvie uh, asking, do I change my oil every 10,000 miles? So that's about 16,000 kilometers, thereabouts? That's a bit high. I'd say 10K. 10K. Generally speaking, though, when the car tells you to, most modern so cars. So 10,000 kilometers or how many miles? 10,000K uh, 10, would be 6,000 6, miles. 6,000 miles. Okay. So uh, for our, fr our uh, friends in the United States, the um, car now tells you, most cars now have an indicator on the dash for an oil change interval. You know, change oil now. Follow that recommendation. Okay, but there's, I think we need to do an important differentiation. So I look at my car, there's no actual sensor in the engine that says that. My car just, I reset it every time I get an oil change. Mm -hmm. Press a button on the dash, it yeah. resets it. Yeah. And that's how I know the next time. Yeah, for me, for, it's 8,000 kilometers. I'd say right? for the older cars, you know, stuff from 07 down, yes, I, uh, I would, I'd be changing the oil every 6,000 kilometers, or every 6,000 miles, 10,000 kilometers. I wouldn't let it go much past that, but you can hop into some of these newer cars, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Mercedes comes to mind. The thing might go 15, 16,000 kilometers or more before it says change your oil. That's too long. If it hasn't changed, if it has, if your car has the ability to tell you to change your oil and it hasn't told you in 12 months to do it, even if you've left it sit for six months, doesn't matter, get it changed, please. But uh, try to keep your oil change intervals to around 10,000 kilometers, 6,000 miles. We got uh, time for just one more question. This is coming from Facebook. When buying a used car, does the manufacturer's warranty still apply to the new owner if you're still within the warranty period? Absolutely. In most cases, um, they might not mention it to you, but in most cases, uh, look in the uh, owner's manual again. It'll tell you how to get the, uh, ownership, uh, not the uh, warranty transferred into their name. It'll tell you. Sometimes they want a, you know, a $50 fee to do the administration fee, but almost every warranty uh, with a new car is transferable to a second owner. Okay. And of course, recalls and extended warranties. Some warranties in your car go eight years. You need to check. I mean, your car has a number of warranties, not just one. It's not just one that covers everything for three years or four years. Yeah, powertrain. Yeah, can they be the powertrain, they get the emission thing, they get all kinds of them now, and you've got to go through the book and look at it. And that stuff certainly applies to a lot of people. And again, those, uh, a lot of people are missing out on a lot of free work. Okay, I'm David Common with CBC Marketplace. I uh, really want to thank you for tuning in with Mark Winton. We got one more set of tips from Mark coming right up. Uh, please uh, check out on Facebook and YouTube the work we've done around 
upsells, upsells particularly going on around car repairs and automotive service centers, dealership service centers. You know, something we learned in this process is that many dealerships are actually making more money now servicing cars than they are selling new and used cars combined. So maintenance has become a really important money maker for them. Mark, when we look at whether it's a dealership service center or wherever people out there might be taking their car, last thought on what are the, the big upsell points that happen most commonly? Uh, the big upsell ones are what's uh, ever the flavor of the month with these people. A lot of them are those, of course, the flushes, uh, changing of the fluids is very common these days. The brake service is another huge one. Uh, tire storage is becoming very common, but you know you want somebody to store your tires and whatnot. Uh, you know maybe it's just a lot cheaper to buy a you know fifty dollar rack of Canadian tire and hang them up in your garage <laughs> rather than somebody do that for you. But uh, those are the common ones these days. All right. Thanks very much, Mark Winton, who is uh, an expert licensed mechanic both cars and trucks. You want to pipe in with one more thing? And yeah, you can get me at carquestions at rogers.com if you want to uh, email me about car a question. question. Okay, an you, email address for Mark if you got follow-ups. And, uh, and the Car Questions uh, YouTube channel. Anytime you got a question, feel free to ask. Okay, that, just that uh, email address one more time because I think I... Car, quest, car Questions at rogers.com. Say it one more time and I'm not going to talk. <laughs> car Questions at rogers.com. Carquestions at rogers.com. Thank you very much, YouTube. Thank you very much, Facebook. Uh, a lot of great questions. I learned a lot. We really appreciate it. See you guys next time. Thanks, Mark. That was really good. Yeah, I think that really worked yeah, out. What, it was uh, fun. Uh, what, remind me, what are the, the big upsell things you were talking about again? Well, you know, the, uh, the uh, for, for buying or repairing? Repairing.